What's the best investment advice you've received? This shit is really fucking hard and it takes a long time, so you gotta This is Ed Sim, founder of Bold Start Ventures, and this is Jarmin Ball, partner at Altimeter. I invited them on the show after reading Ed's tweet on why we are at a time in the cycle where late stage investors would rather get their cash back from investments to either reinvest or redistribute to LPs. How do you guys foresee the M&A markets in 2024? From a regulation standpoint, it is really hard to see any large scale M&A. If you're gonna go public, I think you've gotta be cash flow break even. I think you have to have, you know, 30% plus growth, which is probably what high growth is right now. You've got to be moving towards a rule of 40 or 50 with slanted more towards growth than you are cash flow break even. This is the time to put money to work. Chaps, I am so excited for this. I saw the different Twitter threads going out this weekend and I was like, we have to do this discussion. So first, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Listen, I want to dive in with a little bit of an intro just so people get familiar with each other's voices. So let's start off with you, Jamin, and then move to you, Ed. What do you do? And just provide a little intro for the audience. Yeah, it's great to be here. So I've been in the, the venture world for, let's see, eight, nine years now. I'm, I'm currently at Altimeter Capital. I was at Redpoint Ventures before that. Over at Altimeter, we have two different strategies that that we run. We have a public investing strategy, right? That kind of looks, acts, and feels like a hedge fund. And then a private investing strategy, which looks, acts, and feels like a venture fund. Um, on the venture side is where I spend all of my time. Our primary focus is partnering with companies right around that product market fit uh, point and then beyond. And so whether that's a Series A, a Series B, a Series C, uh, whatever it might be kind of around product market fit and then scaling beyond it is is kind of typically where we look to to partner with founders and businesses come on ed hit me with your intro dazzle me with your good looks <laughs> um i'm a little bit older than than jamin i i'm entering year 28 of doing enterprise software venture capital at the early stages yeah, so um, it's been quite a while. This, we, we had this joke last time because I was born in 96, which I think is the year you entered. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, you've accomplished a lot in a short time, Harry. I, I'm the founder of Bold Start Ventures. Uh, started that in 2010. Um, and our idea is to be the uh, inception stage partner for founders. And you know, you and I went through this whole thing about pre-seed, seed, and whatnot. But inception stage investing for us means uh, collaborating with founders well before they incorporate, helping them iterate on their ideas before they launch, uh, and leading that round upon incorporation so they already know who their first six hires are. They have money in the bank; don't have to waste time. It really saves six months of time to kind of get going. And I also say inception because it doesn't mean it's a pre-seed round because a third time founder is going to raise $10 million out of the gate and they may very well deserve it. Whereas a first time founder may get one. So that's kind of what we do. We also have an opportunity fund that allows us to back the truck up in later stage companies like a sneak or a big ID um, and companies like that as well. Love that. Now, I, I want this to be as much of a discussion as possible, but I'm going to kind of lay the framework and kind of groundwork of the history so far. And so we saw a huge amount of companies in 2020 to 2022 raise these enormous rounds. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of us were involved in some of them. Uh, I know I definitely was. Uh, and often they preemptively kind of before product market fit and with valuations that were, let's just say, extremely high uh, and many years ahead at best. However, but they had so much cash that it was like five years of runway and it's like, ah, oh, we'll punt down a decision down the line. And so I wanted to start with the question of, we all thought, okay, they've got so much runway, it's many years out. Is 2024 the year where a generation of companies suddenly hits the wall? And I'm just going to throw that one out there to start. I'll jump in and say, yeah, okay. I mean, you nailed it. Everyone was like, hey, let's stop the bleeding. Let's extend runway. Uh, two is let's buy time. And then last year was the year we got to see whether these enterprise software companies could execute and grow their businesses. But the years of companies at the later stages going 100% year over year are over. Two is everyone got fit financially in terms of cash, trying to get the cash flow break even. And I think now this is a year, Harry, that you're saying like, shit, if I'm only growing 20% year over year and it's still burning cash, I don't know if I have a business. Like, what the hell am I going to do? I need to figure out kind of, do I, you know, buy another company? Do I exit? Can I get to cash flow break even? So, so this is the year that the shit's hitting the fan because, you know, you can only extend runway so much and it doesn't mean much if you're not growing. That's just my, my opinion, but. 
Yeah. Jamin? No, look, I mean, I, I would say that if I had to summarize that 2021 period, it really was, we crammed five years of fundraising into an 18 month period. And, and I actually, I have a, I don't know if we can show charts, if it'll work, if I share my screen, but I, yeah, I pulled this I, together. So. I'm sure you can share a screen. If you click share at the bottom and then just screen. I pulled, I pulled together some, some pitch book slides or just oh some, some data from pitch book. Oh, um, wonderful. Look at this. Let me know if this, I think it's popping up, but you know, right go. here, you can see on the left-hand side, it's kind of aggregate seed series A capital raised for US-based companies. And I just tagged software, right? So kind of a, a, not an arbitrary tag on PitchBook, uh, but I thought representative of, of what we saw. And then on the right-hand side, it's the same, the same set, but series B, C, D, and E stage businesses, right? And I think what you'll see here is we kind of, we had a trend line right that went crazy in really 2021 and probably the first half of 2022 and now in 2023 we're down 90 percent from where we were at the peak but we're really just back to the 2016 2017 trend line right and if seed and series a was around that five six million dollars a billion dollars a year and series kind of b through e was around that 30 we really, we really took that, right? We multiplied it by five um, and we funded that in an 18 month period. Um, and I think there's a lot of just implications from that, right? If we think about how businesses, you know, were built in the good old days of, right, four years ago, companies would raise a round, they'd hit a milestone or two, and then they'd raise the next round. And that's typically how the cadence worked. In 2021, in the period of ZERP, everyone was risk on, you know, investors across the board, whether it's private, public, uh, de definitely venture. And I think what a lot of folks said was, hey, those milestones we used to require, we don't require them anymore. We just want to invest in companies. And you had companies raising series B rounds, series C rounds that might not have hit the typical milestones a series A stage business needed to. And at the same time, the valuations were super high and, and it basically created this setup where if the world ever shifted to go more risk off, right? Now, all of a sudden, if you want to raise an up round, it's not just do you want to hit one or two milestones. It's you got to hit seven, eight, nine, ten milestones, and you got to grow kind of 10x to do it. And, you know, and lo and behold, what happened? We had this big, big macro slowdown, growth slowed. Everyone started missing plan. It got hard for everyone. And I think the TLDR of coming out of this 2021 period is, Companies who raise those big mega rounds are pretty much all in this overvalued and underperforming bucket, right? And underperforming relative to plan set in 2021. And there are plenty of companies who are saying, hey, we still have lots of cash. Everything's going to work out. Let's kick the can down the road. And then you have some smart companies that are asking themselves these hard questions that I think we're going to talk a little, bit about, a little bit about today, right? Do we have a real enduring business? Are we taking false comfort in the size, in the size of, of our cash balances? And those hard conversations are undoubtedly really kicking into gear now. Can I ask you, Ed, we're both at the seed and predominantly at the seed. I'm looking at this chart going. Oh, I can is, pull it back up. No, no, it's totally fine. But it's like that wasn't how I lived in the last 12 months. It showed, you know, a massive drop to two. Um, seed is as competitive and pricey as ever. That does not okay. seem reflective of my experience. Yeah, at least at the seed. I mean, I kind of we, we also played on both sides, right? Because we also have later stage companies that are at the uh, uh, scale that that Jamin had mentioned. But man, I got to tell you this is that I think the inception rounds uh, were off the charts last year because there's data from Carta that shows you that if you look at uh, priced rounds from Q1 of 2021 compared to let's say Q4 of last year, the only round that increased in valuation was the seed round you know, quote unquote, seed around. And that's because, you know, you you have a factor of late stage investors maybe pausing. Um, Multi-stage funds decided to slow down the growth and they said, gee, why not kick the can down the road as well? Let me invest in two founders and an idea. I don't care what price. It's not going to be at 100x multiple. Um, the cheapest entry price for winning company is going to be that first check. So maybe I'll price it at 40 or 50 posts and it doesn't really matter. But Harry, it does matter to us when we have a business model that is predicated on, you know, trying to find uh, these great opportunities at, at attractive, you know, prices with founders, right? So, so that I think there's a massive bubble with, with what I call inception stage. 
so i totally agree with you so i i'm learned to be more and more open over time um i i obviously do portfolio evaluation you know quarterly as everyone does um i don't have any companies running out of cash this year i think the closest one to running out of cash is 18 months everyone's just kicking it down the road so i i don't think this is the year of mortality and i push back strongly when you look at yours do you have a generation of like you know a series of companies dying in 24 or are you in the similar boat in which case 2024 won't be well i i think the question really is is um what is dying relatively uh, just because you have 24 or 36 months of cash doesn't mean you have a business. And I think that, uh, I think, Jem, and you had mentioned earlier too, like kind of on one of the tweets is, um, you know, this is a year that boards and then founders should have honest conversations, right? And I think that there are going to be a lot of boards that just don't have that conversation. And the honest conversation is going to be, hey, if I keep doing what I'm doing and founder in particular, what does my business look like three years from now? A, do I have a business? Um, and B, you know, can I grow into that valuation ever? And if I can't, if I can never grow into that valuation, then should I keep doing what I'm doing? Right. And then if I have to go out and raise capital at one fifth, the last price, maybe that's the best thing. Cause we think that they can eventually build a real good business down the line and whatnot. But I think those conversations are not being had and they must be, they must be made now. Like there's no reason to wait three or four years from now, if you know that you're only going to be worth one third, what you're going to be at a multiple instead of 100x at 10x or 12x Ford, which is going to be a really good multiple. So just have so it now. Why wait? Just so I understand, what are the questions that board members should be asking and how should founders be thinking about that just practically? First, I think you have to ask yourself is, I mean, I'll go very, very basic, um, is like, hey, founder, do you have the energy and conviction to keep going? Like, do you really believe in what you're doing? Because if they don't have the energy and conviction, then I think it doesn't matter what you do, right? It just doesn't matter. Maybe they've been at it five years. You know how many founders have been at it five, six, seven years right now sitting on valuations that are probably one third kind of where they're at. Um, and maybe they're tired, right? So sometimes you may have that conversation with the founder and they may feel relieved. You may say like, hey, one of the later stage investors in this round is okay getting their money back. Sometimes you hear this sigh of relief, like, oh my God, like, like yeah. Oh, wow. Like, it, it, hey, this would be a win for you. And by the way, early stage investors, you make make three times your money back. And by the way, founders, given like how much cash you have in the balance sheet right now, maybe you only spent half it, maybe you still have 40 or 50 million bucks, that can be distributed back if you have an exit. So if we work on finding the right exit opportunity for you, A, you can have a graceful opportunity to say you sold your business. B is you can, um, you can not have to worry about growing into some insane valuation and the later stage investors will thank you. And three is, Perhaps, depending on where you're able to land the plane, let's say, uh, with the right company, you might be able to get some equity value for yourself and your employees and also get a retention pool. So you can create situations where it's a win-win-win, but you have to have that conversation. And sometimes the founder will say, fuck you, I'm going to keep going and it doesn't matter. And that conversation could take 12 months. But I can tell you this, if you don't have the conversation, then you're not doing a service as a board member or investor for that founder, period. Mm -hmm. So I had Jason Lamkin on the show and he says, there's no point doing this. There's no point because they'll just say, fuck you. And then they'll just hate you. And like nine out of 10, they just say, fuck you. And so you just ruin the relationship. Oh, oh, but by the way, Harry, I've had them, I've had founders say, fuck you. And then by the way, when they exit, like, thank you very much. Like you just saved me it's time. Good. And so they're always going to say, fuck you. Why, why would they? Because if they wanted to do it, they'd come to you first and say they want to do it, but they're going to say, fuck you. But if you don't get the fuck you, you're not doing your job for them too. Yeah. And, and Harry, what, I, what I'd add is I think what we'll get into, this is why these processes end up taking 12, 18 months is because it's not 12, 18 months of negotiating with an acquirer or figuring out how to do a dividend back of to the preferred, right? It takes 18 months because these are really hard decisions that are often very contentious in the early days. And it takes a long time to get the early stage investors, the late stage investors, and the founders like all on the same page in agreement that this is the right thing to be done. And I think you do have, and, and this is something I'm, I'm right trying to learn in my career, right? You do have just a class of what I would call founder friendliness, right? Mm -hmm. That isn't really the true founder friendliness, right? To be a truly founder friendly investor and board member, it is about having those hard conversations. It's not about shying away from conflict. Can, can I just take one step back though? Yeah. I know that a lot of the companies right now, I just want to be really clear is that 
these are the companies that maybe have five, 10, 15 million of ARR. Maybe they're priced at 300 to 500 to a billion dollars of, of valuation. But there's a different part here on the earlier stage of the stack. I want well, to be this, clear. This that, is my point. I've got a ton and, of companies at that are like 15K MRR and it's oh, three yeah, so, years so, in. Let's go back mm-hmm. to that. I mean, usually in those situations, it's not like, you know, investors like us aren't asking for our money back in a lot of those. It's- Ab, why can't we ask for our money back? If we're being blunt, if it's three years to minimal, minimal revenues and you're just going, listen, this isn't working. You tried. Fair enough. But you know, we gave it our best shot. But let's call it a day and move on to something different. Your time is the most valuable thing. Work on something else. Start afresh. Why is it so bad to ask for money back? I'm not saying it's bad to ask for money back. I'm just saying, so in that case, three years after you've tried three times, I'm just saying that, you know, once again, it's 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 the founder and the conviction that they have. And if they can get the team rallied around kind of what the next opportunity is, then yeah, you keep going. And if not, then you look at alternatives, right? I want to move to that conversation then because it's a tough one to have. And there's many competing voices on a board in a cap table. Um, So what are the different incentives between, as we said, founders early and late? And how does that determine where the conversation goes? There's one variable here that is becoming a lot more important that I don't think a lot of people really thought about, founders or investors, which is the size of the pref stack, right? One of the downsides of raising these big, massive rounds is now all of a sudden your pref stack is really big. And that really starts to come into play when we think about an acquisition. What price can you truly be acquired at? And is it greater than that pref stack? And the reason this this matters, right, is I think when, and again, just to speak in gen, you know, broad strokes here, you have a lot of late stage investors who I think the typical stereotype is, they can get very reflex, you know, very, um, um, you know, they can jump around and how they view the world. Like they can have loose conviction, right? At the at the first sign of things not going well, they're going to want to jump ship, pull the ripcord, and get out, and maybe kind of atone for some of the sins of the high valuation rounds. And you know, they can flip flop around a lot more. I think on the flip side, you know, the very early stage investors there's very different dynamics in play, right? I'd say the earlier you go from a fund dynamic, the more your fund returns are driven by bigger power law outcomes in you know, a 0x, a 1x, a 2x, right? It's all kind of the same thing, right? It's either it's a 100x or it's not. Uh, and so you might have, oh, I can see you wanting to jump in, Harry. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, go I'm, for just, it. I'm just intrigued. Do you think late stage investors have come to that realization moment of, fuck it, 2021 was a wild time. If we get 1x, we've done okay. Has that realization hit? Um, let me share. Let me share something with you. Uh, and I, I think this just... See what I, there's some data here. Sets, I love this. <laughs> this just sets the stage, right? And, and I want to walk through the math of 100x ARR round at scale, right? And what we have here are public... So- like the median multiple for public software companies going back to call it the beginning of 2015. And what you'll see is that, you know, on average, software companies trade around seven and a half times forward revenue, right? You can ignore that 2020, 2021 period when interest rates went to zero. And so companies on average are going to exit at seven to eight times forward revenue, right? Another cut at this data is looking at you know what percentage at any given point in time what percentage of public companies are trading over 10 times revenue right there are points on this graph where it was zero there was not one public software company trading over 10 times right there was a period of time very recently where that number was low single digits so the math here is and and, and this is why we can get into as well what we're still seeing today but some of the challenges of these 100x arr rounds and i'm not talking about a 100x valuation when you're at you know 200k of arr i'm talking when you're at you know 10 plus right and your valuation is into the billions and you're raising at you know a 100x multiple if you're going to exit at 10 times and 10 times like the point of this slide 10 times is actually you know you're a top 15% public software company if you're getting a 10x plus multiple. If you wanna go from an entry price of 100 to an exit price of 10, you're going to have dilution along the way, right? Maybe you have 20 to 30% dilution along the way. Just to get back to the price, to the valuation that you were given, you have to grow your top line probably 
12, 13 X, right? You know, you're going to have a little bit of dilution, right? That 20, 30% plus the multiple compression from a hundred to 10. That's really, that's really hard. Right. And as we've seen over the last few years, growth is slowed. And so as growth comes down, multiple also comes down and it, you know, growing 13 X just to grow into your valuation. That's, that's really hard to do. And if you're a late stage investor and you want to get a three, four, five X return, you got to grow 40, 50 X your top line from that initial investment. So there are just a lot of these investments that I do think are, are in a tough position in terms of like where their valuation was relative to where the business is today. Um, and that's a challenge, right? I think there's the vast majority of companies who raise these mega rounds in 2021 will probably never be worth um, at any point in time, right? The valuation that they were given in the public markets. And, and that's just this inherent challenge of when you come to that realization, like, what do you do? Um, a great example would be that at the end of last year, I'm not in the room with Loom, but that last round valuation was at $1.5 billion, right? That was led in 2021 and they sold for nine ninety nine or something, nine fifty, right? So, you know, clearly the last investor that underwrote that was probably thinking, I'm going to get a three X on this thing. Um, but instead they decided to, you know, vote with the founders to sell the business. I'm sure they got their lick pref back. Um, and I think basically the loom might've only raised a few hundred million dollars. So there's $600 million of Delta sitting there or, you know, between the founders, the management team and everything else, plus some incentives. So, you know, that's a situation where you ask the question is, are some late stage investors saying, yeah, maybe one X is great and I can reinvest that. I think I'm seeing more of that based mm -hmm. on the companies that I'm in from the people that I'm talking to anecdotally. I'm not a late stage investor, but I do know from the boards I'm on, I can see a lot of people starting to get wind of that and then figuring out from a portfolio triage perspective, which are the third that may, to Javin's point, are the ones that are going to grow into the valuations or are, are almost there where they, they may just need a little bit more comp, uh, cash on a flat round so that I can actually create a return. So gonna, it's we're, happening. It's happening. We're going to get into why they might want that liquidity with bridge rounds and everything in between. I yep. do just want to ask on the 100x ARR, bringing it back to actual today, you know, there is still one segment that is fucking nuts and it's AI. <laughs> and there are a lot of AI founders who today who have crazy ass term sheets on the table that are very reminiscent of 2021 pricing environments. What do you advise them? Because someone is giving you a lot of money at an exorbitant price. Should founders come back and say, thank you, Jamin, but I don't want your 150 million valuation. I would like it to be 60 million instead. Look, I, I think, and my hope would be that a lot of the conversation we're having today is for, is trying to foreshadow a lot of the dangers and risks that arise from raising one of those crazy rounds. And like the way that we talk about it internally is don't make the cap table a risk to your business, right? Build a business the old fashioned way, raise smaller amounts of money, right? More frequently that are more milestone based where when you raise a round, you know what you're signing up for, for the next 18 months. And you feel good about getting there because there's just this inherent risk. Of... I see Harry laughing. I see Harry <laughs> laughing because he knows <laughs> that when you're, throwing, when you're throwing, when you're throwing a thousand X, it's going to be hard yeah. to say no. And, and it is. I know you're laughing at that, Harry. I'm laughing because it's also like, I mean, sorry, love nicely at jam. It's unrealistic. I'm sitting there with like, you know, some of the mega fun stuff. I'm like, why did you do that deal? It's crap. And they're like, I do dude, think though. Wait, wait, and, they're like, think and they're like, but wait, and they're like, I'm fundraising next year. We need to deploy. We've got billion, billion, five, two billion. And they know they've got more money coming from their LPs. They're top funds. It's a deployment game. And so I think that last statement though is where the rubber is going to start to meet the road, right? I think there is this assumption that from a, from a fund standpoint, not a company standpoint, we're always going to be able to raise. We have the brand. Investors are always asking to you know, get into our funds. I think that is the part of the cycle that we haven't gotten to. Right. We haven't got, I don't, I don't think we're going to get really... there, Jamin. We're not going to get there. We're not going to, you're going to get there with a couple of shit ones, I admit. But you know, when you're looking at your Andreessen's, your general catalyst, your lights, because I know you guys don't like to name names. I'm happy to, but uh, like, you know, with these guys, you know, as they scale, you just move into pension fund world, sovereign world, and they're looking at six, 7% nets. And so these guys come in and say, Hey, we'll give you 10, maybe 11%. And they go, Oh, inshallah, take our money, take our money. And so, 
I don't think it does hit the road. And then you've got NASDAQ booming. And so their publics are looking better. And actually it offsets the denigration in private performance. I don't think it's going to change. I, I, I do have, a, I do have a, a thought though. I do see more founders um, actually do, getting religion. I mean, I frankly think that this class of companies that are started, and I'm talking about, we, we did eight net new investments last year, and we only did three the prior year with our largest fund yet, because a lot of founders are getting religion. I don't need to tell founders, you don't need to raise six or $7 million at the highest price possible anymore. They know that if they set the bar too high from the very beginning, it's going to be hard to kind of meet that uh, expectation. And they also know, by the way, unless you're getting thrown a thousand X, right? You know, from some crazy, I think they know for the most part, I'm saying on the margin, we're re-educating founders again, that you've got to build back the way we used to build. And that every time you take a check, Every time you take a check at a higher price, you limit your exit options. Make sure when you take that check, you know where you're going. Because those checks, by the way, for the most part, Harry, are harder to come by. You're not getting 10 term sheets in, in 10 days anymore. You're getting, you know, you're getting a few. And, and, and now I think the best part about this world, uh, and I'm, I'm advising founders and investors, is that we, we're moving from a transaction-driven world to a relationship-driven world now, in the sense that since things are taking a little bit more time, Founders, as much as investors, need to get to know who's joining their boards right now. I think the open AI thing was the best thing that ever happened in the sense like enlightened people to say, who's my board member? How are they going to stick with me through good times and bad times? Because it's going to really matter in the next few years. So everything we learned during Zerp is going to, is undone right now. Unless you're an AI company getting a thousand X and I can part, I can tell you that if a founder had that, it'd be hard for them to say no. If I was in their shoes, it'd be hard for me to say no. I'm just being realistic, right? I, I totally agree. Sorry for getting on a high horse there. I, uh, <laughs> I just, uh, I, I also like, I listen to so many podcasts and it's like, you know, ah, oh, we should get back to building the old way and doing it was our fault. We foie gras the shit out of companies. <laughs> like, let's just be honest. Like we, and I'm not well, saying we as in us, but like our industry did. And, and yeah, I mean, I, well, I definitely was in preemptive rounds where I was foie growing people. Everyone did. I mean, we played the game that was on the field until until the chair stopped, and we can say that we did better than others or not. But the game that was on the field, you can you have to play it, right? So one other thing I would say to Jamin's point and your point is that um, let's move to a world of exits that you no longer have mega exits anymore. Like for example, I sat through the customer thing. It took us sixteen months from signing to sell to Meta because of antitrust regulations, right? Um, and and so. Ed, would, Ed almost, would, that, would, would that have gone through today, do you think? Fuck no. No way. And by the way, it had nothing to do with anything other than they, they hated Zuckerberg, right? I mean, really, it, customer was a business-to-business -business software thing, and you had Ireland to go through. You had the EU to go through. You had the U.S. to go through, right? So so that was a, you know, reportedly, according to Bloomberg, over a billion dollar exit. But the point is, is that let's say those go away and in a world that you have 300 to $400 million exits, the world where Palo Alto repeatedly buys companies for 150 to $600 million. How much money can a capital, can a company take in order for investors to make money? What does that mean for late stage investors? Jam, I'd love to know kind of how you're thinking about it. How do you choose which are the ones that are going to be the $3 billion companies? Because please tell me so I know where I can be setting down the plank. <laughs> You know, how, how does that happen, right? Because if early guys will do well, as long as they're not paying 50 to 75 pre for some of these inception rounds, you know, if they exit a three to 500, but you need more of those to return a fund. So it changes the dynamics of everything where ownership matters and choosing what, what can go along matters. Jamin, hit me. Yeah, hit, hit us, yeah. man. <laughs> what, 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 yeah, uh, what, 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 what's the first thing I should dig into? What, what, yeah, what would be? What, I would love to I know, start? like, how do you, how do you know, like, when a company is doing five to ten million, um, when, when you know that's going to be that, you know, multi-billion-dollar, you know, at scale yeah. business. I think the realization that everyone has had recently is, look, there really just aren't that many special markets, and in those special markets, there's not that many special companies that exercise the right to be special. Right. In 2021, everyone was funded indiscriminately as you are going to be a public company. You're in a market that's big enough. You have a product that's differentiated enough to support a public market type company. And when I say public market type company, what does that mean? It's you are sustaining growth at 100, 200 million plus of ARR, right? Sustaining, meaning you're growing, call it 30, 40, 50 percent plus. The universe of companies that can do that is very small. Right. And when you raise a round, when you raise that series A round, the thing that I always tell myself is, okay, is this a business that is going to peter out at 50 
or can it get to 100? When you do that Series D, Series E round, the question is, is it not a business that is going to peter out at 50? It's, is it a business that can get to 100, 200 million of ARR, still growing 30, 40%? And there's just not that many markets with products that are differentiated enough um, to get there. Right. Can I ask what what are, what, are, yeah. what, are, what, are, what are the reasons why a company peters out at 50, 60, 70? Because I often speak to growth investors and I'm super jacked about my portfolio company being at 10 or 15. And I'm like, this is a rocket. And they're like, dude, I've seen so many of these peter out at 50, 60, 70. And I'm like, oh, why? The base, you know, basic ones, right? The market just wasn't that big, right? There were some early adopters, maybe in Silicon Valley that were using your product, uh, but the reality is, is you never really broke into the enterprise, right? You never really broke into where the big dollars were. And it's hard to make the unit economics really work and scale when you're kind of servicing these smaller type cust uh, customers. Am I being too harsh to say that the difference between those that peter out and those that don't is just a simply great founder? Because the simply great founder builds that go-to-market machine that smashes the enterprise. The great founder moves into that second chapter of the business. Is that That's too a huge ingredient. Yeah, it's definitely a huge ingredient, right? Um, and you see some of the most successful public companies today, the CrowdStrikes of the world, the Datadogs of the world, right? And it's exactly what you just said. It's moving from a point solution to a platform. Like that's really hard. Before we actually go to that, like, do you sell and M&As, IPOs? We mentioned before about kind of late stage investors getting liquidity, being happy with a 1X, being able to recycle that capital bridge rounds are we going to see bridge rounds or are we going to actually see the preservation of cash from investors and shy away from anything that's not a great company purely to concentrate capital into the best how do we feel about that bridge round just before we touch on MA and ipo what one clarification i think um as a as someone who does kind of like that growth stuff as well i don't think anyone's happy with a 1x <laughs> right it's a little bit of <laughs> hey is a 1x in the context of right what happened over the last few years an acceptable type outcome where you can recycle that money back into new opportunities? And I'll go back to, um, I listened to this podcast with Doug Leone, which I just absolutely loved. Um, and he talked about a, the fun, a fund that they had. I can't remember if it was kind of a 2000 or more of a 2008 type vintage uh, where they had to kind of kick, scratch and claw to get from... I think, and again, I, I might be misremembering misremem the numbers here, um, but you know, a less than one X type fund, right? I think he maybe called it a 0.3 or 0.4 X fund to a 1.9, right? And what he said was what you can't do as an investor is blame vintage and move on to the next fund, right? They fought to make every fund a positive vehicle for their investors. And one way to do that is through recycle. Right. Um, it's through taking investments that maybe didn't get to the exit you hoped for that three X. Maybe you got that one X taking those proceeds and recycling it back into into new opportunities. Right. And so I think what you do have is a lot of investors who are thinking now, hey, is that a good thing? Should we be doing that? And I, I think that can be a way of finding returns for investors in funds that were more challenging vintages. But I think the wrong answer is giving up, blaming vintage and, and moving on. I would add to that is that if you look at funds, everyone talks about uh, kind of that outlier, especially at the early stages that drives kind of performance, like the one to two outliers that drives the massive performance. But if you don't quit, on the founders and work with the founders on the less on the bottom third, you could probably cobble together another 0.5 to 0.75 X from some of those exits by returning 75% of the cash back on certain deals, maybe getting a 1.3 X where it's not that heroic, you know, and then maybe a two X here or there, but you cobble some of those things together. That can be the difference between a, you know, top 25% fund or a top 10% fund. Yeah. Can I ask you guys just a blunt question? If my biggest mistake was, not selling positions that I really should have done. What were your biggest mistakes that you reflect back on? Hmm. I would, I literally just had my annual meeting in November. And, you know, as I said, we have an early stage, you know, we have the inception fund and we have an opportunity fund where you back the truck up in the winters. And I would probably say that um, we're very ownership focused. We love ownership. Uh, we always want to lean in the pro ratas, but ownership matters to an extent, right? So everything's not always going up and to the right. And I had the same probably realization that you do, Harry, is that um, maybe we could have sold some a little bit down, sold a little down kind of on the way up uh, instead of leaning in 1000%, right? I mean, 
And so, you know, those are the balances that you have to kind of look at over time. Ab, we're in deals together. You continuously concentrate capital and do kind of bridge rounds where rounds aren't in place. You're like, which is fascinating to see. I've really learned a lot from you in this way. How many, I'm just interested. How many of those work out positively versus negatively? I'd say probably two thirds work out more positively than negatively, but the ones wow. that work out can be outliers. I mean, look, we lean into... I've found that everything is not always up and to the right. And when you fund things that are way ahead of the market, that are kind of new categories or just kind of doing things completely different, it always requires something extra. You know, guy from Sneak, um, we funded him three times before he got his A round done. No one wanted to fund that company. They're like, I don't think open, why is he focused only on JavaScript open source? Why is he only focused on developers? Developers don't care about security. I can I have a list of 100 firms. I'll pull up the spreadsheet one day and I'll show you all the firms that said no multiple times over. Okay, that's one. A big ID, three rounds before they got their A round done. And then Zuckerberg was sitting in front of Congress testifying about privacy. And then all of a sudden they raised a bunch of money and, and they're doing very well. Security scorecard, oh, the market's not big enough. It's not this, it's not that. They did over 100 million of ARR last year. Um, and they required a bridge around between seed and A before Sequoia jumped in. And the final one I'd say is um, uh, even customer. We required a bridge between the A and the B because people are like, gee, you just need a few more check boxes to uh, compete against Zendesk before I even believe in your innovative kind of new way of doing things. So all of our best winners, I can't tell you any of them were the ones where you came in and said, A, first of all, those founders are just the lights out founders like the, the Airbnbs because they aren't until they are. And then two is that there's always going to be a come to Jesus moment. And if you have some insights and you have some trust and the founders have conviction, the truth is founders have so much fucking conviction and you watch them and you see the customers kind of, you know, looking at the product, maybe they're not signed yet, but you talk to them and that you see the energy, you lean in, you're not going to get everyone in them. Right. Cause I can tell you a bunch that didn't work out, but if they do work out in the margin, that's where you get that extra Delta. Jamin, what would you yeah. say your reflections are on mistakes? Yeah, there's kind of three buckets of mistakes folks can make when kind of investing at the stage that I do, right? One bucket is a simple one, like, did we just pick wrong, right? Like, was the company just uh, like not in a good market? Did the product actually not work, um, right? Did, did, did we pick the wrong company? Then there is, did we forecast wrong, right? Did we have expectations for how the business was going to perform? And were, were we just really off? they're obviously kind of related. And then the third one, which is maybe only relevant in the 2021 period, because before that, you didn't think any anything else, but it's, did we get the exit multiple wrong, right? And so those three buckets of mistakes, I think were very common, right? Like on, on the, the latter end, there were folks who said, hey, this, this kind of these public multiples, 20, 30, 40 times revenue, like that's a new normal. Like we can underwrite to a 30X exit multiple and then we'll make money, right? Like it's totally crazy in hindsight, but I'm sure there were people who made those types of mistakes. Um, I think the mistakes that I made, right? When I reflect back was that middle category, right? It was forecasting wrong. It was saying, hey, I think I'm identifying a good market and a good business, but I had an expectation for growth durability that just didn't happen. And part of that was macro related, right? It got harder for everyone, but part of it was getting back to the conversation that we had earlier, which is there are different things businesses need to get done and to achieve that help them sustain growth at 50 million of ARR, at 100 million of ARR, at 150 million of ARR, right? It's turning that point solution into a platform. It's, is that point solution, does it have enough what I call strategic real estate where you can truly layer on other products around it and build the foundation of a platform? Or is your point solution actually part of someone else's platform that will get layered into someone else's platform and you don't have the strategic real estate? And so I think not accurately forecasting forward was the biggest mistake that I made. And again, when you're investing at bigger valuations, like that is where you can really run into a lot of challenges. So we, we can we can fire back. Just have to ask, you mentioned that like forecasting and exit multiples. Mm -hmm. Um like you, you guys did hop in at eight billion. Yeah. Yeah. How how does one rationalize? I'm just genuinely interested. How does one rationalize doing that if one wants a three X? Like, did one genuinely think that's a twenty five billion dollar company? Yeah, look, again, I think this this does get back to in that 
2021 period, there were plenty of businesses that if you just looked at their historical performance, you'd say that is N of one. And if we kind of project that forward, like it's the next thing. And I think there was a case to be made that, hey, virtual events are going to be an enduring part of the future. I think what ended up happening in practice was COVID went away and there was just tons of pull forward. There were lots of businesses that no longer made sense that, right, were using that platform that churned off. And, and that turned into a situation where you had a business now that probably no longer made sense in the new world, which was really the old world, right, that we lived in. And so I'd say the mistake there was thinking that, hey, this thing um, that hit insane product market fit right? That had like the best product market fit. You have to go back now. And a lot of companies are doing this. Did we really have product market fit, right? Or was it just market fit, right? Did we, were we just the thing that everyone had to grab and use because they all needed it all at once, but maybe we didn't. And this isn't hopping specific. This is just kind of broader, right? Like maybe we just hadn't actually built the thing right, right? And now that the world is coming out of that and there isn't that insane market fit, are there alternatives? Are there different ways of, of solving this problem? And I think there's, you know, there's two sides of product market fit. There's the product in the market. And when we had this jostle that was the 2021 period and COVID and everyone was kind of like in their homes, um, I think the fundamental thing, right, that we got wrong there was kind of projecting what the world would look like when we come out of COVID, right? And it ended up, you know, there was not product market fit, right, coming out of COVID. And then what do you do with a company that right might not have it? Um, and so that that's maybe kind of the best I can do on on that one. I actually hear this conversation going on about platforms and during companies and stuff. I also don't want to scare kind of founders away either because I like to say it's uh, not the TAM you start with, it's a TAM you exit with. And what I'm saying really is is that I don't want a founder coming in and telling me I'm going to start a platform company. I mean, what 10 person company is going to come out and sell a platform and compete against the giants, right? I need a founder to come what, in. What, what, what about Rippling? Well, he's a special guy. Look at him. He did something before, right? I mean, he did something before. He knew what he was doing. He started out with a massive kind of uh, uh, checkbook uh, when he started, right? That was a big round. So he's a special founder. And I think there are special founders that can do that. But I'm talking about your average everyday founder that no one even knows about. The way you do it, is that um, I like to say, you've got to be able to zoom in, zoom in on the end user, zoom in on how you make their life 10 times better with your product and how you can uniquely solve that problem. So you sell the product, but then you can market the vision to us. I like to ask the question in three to five years, if everything went right, what does this look, look like? And you, then you get the idea of like, hey, I'm going to start here, but I made, I could jump into three other places, right? So I just want to tell founders that, you know, I like them to start kind of on a narrow path with a vision that they can go bigger. And I just don't know which direction it can go. I just don't want to scare them to think like, hey, I need to find a platform from the very beginning because it's the very rare founder that can go and do that. And it's usually a second or third time founder. And people are like, let's give that person 20 million bucks, right? And so I just wanted to kind of throw that in there and into the mix. Yeah. And Parker is incredibly unique as a. Oh, as the a guy, he's, he's super unique. He, he often comments on my tweets, though. And I'm like, yes, but that's for you. And like, it doesn't count. Did you know so, he was an intern for me uh, once uh, when he was no a, an undergrad at Harvard? Yeah. Oh, no I, kidding. I, I, that's a bit of a miss, Ed. No offense. You should have kept that relationship alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ed's going, God, Harry used to be so nice when he started this show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, okay, you check I around the block have... long enough, things like that happen. <laughs> you, know what, you, you get jaded, don't you, Ed? Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, I do have to ask you, because there's kind of different scenarios in terms of exits. You could have M&A. We, we mentioned customer in the Facebook there, but you can also have IPO. If we start on M&A, I take a very negative view as to M&A moving forward because I don't think anyone's looking to add headcount and add cost. And I think regulatory has never been worse. How do you guys foresee the M&A markets in 2024? And am I wrong to be so negative? You can start first, Jam, if you want. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I would say from a regulation standpoint, it is really hard to see any large scale M&A right now right in in this you know administration in this environment like that is a a really hard path that i think every company now right looking at kind of like the figma adobe um resolution is saying do we want to embark 
on a big, distracting, distracting to employees, distracting to customers process, if the end state is most likely a no-go, right? Or, or not approved. Um, and I think a lot of boards and founders are saying, it's not worth it. We don't even want to embark on that potential. Um, and so right now, like that, that door is, is, is maybe closed. Um, for the smaller scale m and right? I think this is why it's so important to start having these conversations now with these companies. There's only so many acquirers. And the reality is, is any acquisition, small or large, takes time and energy. Um, and it on some level is a distraction, right? You can't have Palo Alto isn't going to go acquire 10 companies, right? In the next year, they might acquire a couple. Same with all these other like large acquirers. And so I think when it comes to these acquisitions, you will see them. Um, you'll see two different types of them. You'll see aqua hires, which is really more of a, hey, these are special people that we want to bring under kind of our tent. Or it is a right kind of like the the sneak acquisition playbook of there are tangential products to what we offer that we think are very strategic to the overall thing that we are building right snowflake just announced um, an acquisition of a company called samua which is a business that we work with right they viewed that product is very accretive to their overall platform um so i think you're going to see a lot of companies looking to be acquired. There's only so many companies that can be absorbed. Um, and I think that will be a bottleneck, which again is just why it's so important to start having these conversations, these conversations now. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> but I, I, think, I, think, okay. I think that's a great answer. Like very few huge M&As because of antitrust, maybe save cybersecurity, which has national security interests and those things tend to go a little bit faster. But other than that, no. Um, Aqua hires for public companies, I'd say not really. Um, and I say what happens is if you're the one prod company, back to your point, Jim, and if you're the one prod company and things are going well, but not as well as you thought, this is your opportunity because ultimately it's a game of musical chairs. There are so many seats out there available for uh, like a Palo Alto to buy a DSPM player or some other kind of player. They're going to look at five of them and they're going to talk to all five of them. I mean, even when Sneak bought... The last company that we just bought in the ASPM space, we talked to three or four and we ultimately found the team that we wanted at the price that we wanted with the product that we wanted, right? But there is, because of all the funding that has happened in the last three years, there's 10 of everything. And in this game of musical chairs, there'll be a couple winners and a lot of losers. And so the sooner you can get your ducks in a row and have the conversation and say, am I enduring a business or not? Am I going to be the one acquiring other companies uh, or, or not? Uh, then you can determine kind of what your fate's going to be. Look, we just sold uh, a company right towards the end of the year as well. Uh, PagerDuty bought uh, Jelly. Uh, Nora is a fantastic founder. Uh, they wanted to get into the incident analysis space uh, and evolve, and that fit you know well, right? I mean, they're clearly looking at some other companies. Um, we also, you know, can I, I think be wrong, though? These, these aren't, and I, I've had these, two, these aren't needle movers for firms in any way though, are they? They're like, you get, get cash back and you're like, it, you're like it just, it just depends. I, I would say it just depends on the situation. Um, but if you have a product that people need and you're ahead of the curve and maybe you're not the best at sales and marketing, but you're really great at building, you can create some pretty good valuable exits, right? Look at all the stuff that Palo Alto bought. A lot of those companies had two to $3 million of ARR getting sold for two, three, $400 million, right? So I would say that, you know, those are the discussions you have to have and you've got to be open. It also goes to not taking too much cash up front because that limits your ability to exit at those numbers. And the final thing I'd say is that we haven't talked about yet is private to privates. This is where, for example, like the airplane to air table situation, I think, you know, if you look at the numbers, um, I know there's a lot of debate online, but let's just assume that if they only spent half of the 40 million, there was $20 million of cash on the, on the, on the, on the balance sheet. So perhaps, uh, you know, the founders and investors, um, you know, made some, made some money on it, right? Maybe they took Airtable at a, I don't know what price they took it at, but maybe they took it at a, at a higher price, maybe inflated price that they would have to grow into. Maybe they distributed the cash back. Maybe there's a retention pool. But you're going to see more private to private as well. And the reason why that makes sense for a, a private company is because if you're a one product company going back to the platform play, you're going to go, ha you're going to have to buy another product or two and show that you can get out to the public markets with two or three products and that you can be a true platform that you can buy something, you can integrate it and you can sell it. So I think you'll see, while it's harder to do on the private to private side, there'll be some more privates coming down the line for some of these unicorns who say, gee, I think the only way for me to go public is to is to add more products uh, to the, you know, to my platform.
But are those boards approving them? I mean, boards obviously are, are core to those discussions. Are they going to say, yeah, you should you should acquire that well, new company? We, we just sold a atomic jar to Docker. Docker is 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 from what you see out there is a company that can go public in the next two years, two to three years. This just gets back to one of these core themes we're talking about today. If you get acquired for a hundred to three hundred. Right, The difference in whether you as a founder and your employees can make really good money right, or make no money can be the difference of did you raise a crazy round or, or did you not? And the challenge is a lot of these companies that will exit kind of in that band could have made really significant money right, for the founders, for the year and the employees. But the challenge is they raised $200 million of cash and now all of a sudden their pref stack is really big. They're sitting on a really high valuation. And that exit path now is a really hard thing to get to um, because of some of these rounds that were raised in, in 2021. And so in a world where my private multiple is going to start to converge more with public multiples, what do I need to do from a business standpoint to get to a kind of two to three X markup? Do I think I can get to those metrics in the next two to three years? Can my market support right that size business in this market? I think asking those questions and knowing, hey, when we raise a round of funding, kind of like, what are we implicitly signing up for for the next few years? And just being honest around, and can we get there? I, I think that's an important part of kind of fundraising conversations today. Can we get that, Ed, you mentioned Docker, you know, being in a position to go public in the next two to three years. Um, IPO windows. Um, I had Jason Lemkin on the show. He said, ah, 2024 is the year of, ah, fuck it. We might as well go public. Um, <laughs> it's time to move out of the basement. Um, do we agree? Is 2024 the year of, fuck it, we might as well move out of the basement? The IPO markets are always open, right? You can always go public. It's just a question of, do you want to accept the market clearing price at that point in time. You can go, companies could have gone public in 2022. It just would have been at a much lower valuation, right? Relative to a, their last private round or, or what they were expecting to get. Uh, so I would say the markets are wide open. It's just a question of, do you want to go public and do you want to accept the reality of what that valuation means, right? Um, in many ways, I think an IPO is a great, point in time, it's a great event. It's a great transaction for businesses to kind of reset the cap table, right? All the preferred is converted to common. Your shareholder base starts to turn over, right? You can innovate in the public markets. I think there are plenty of examples of companies who are able to innovate and kind of like build act two, three, four, like in the public markets. Um, and so again, like, I think you will see companies who start to say, Hey, look, Let's just reset this business, right? We'll take a down round IPO, but guess what? Public stocks go up, public stocks go down. Private valuations should go up, private valuations should go down. Let's levels, let's reset this business in the public markets. Let's get liquidity for folks who have been here for a while. Um, if that's at a down round to our 2021 ZERP round, so be it. We'll manage it. We'll set employee expectations and we'll grow from there. Is there ever a case where it's just too much? And so if you take an example like, and I'm, I'm yeah, again, this is not you, I'm using it, so any problems, it's on me. Um, but like Carter is at 400 million in ARR. Henry's been very public about that. If you were to apply the 10x revenue multiple to them, they'd be at 4 billion for the best in class. And they probably wouldn't be that because their margins on the services side are not as high at 51, 52%. So say they'd be, you know, 8x. Okay, so they're trading at three and a half to four billion when they go public. Their last round was at seven, seven and a half. When you are that far off, three and a half billion dollars in enterprise value off, is that too big to assail that gap? Or is it still, fuck it, let's go out its best? Look, Snowflake was trading at $400 a share. That's trading at $200 a share, right? It's, it's still half, like despite the recovery we've seen in public stocks, right? Like that business is trading at half of what it was trading at the peak. And, but that are all things that can be worked through. What we're not seeing, right? If we rewind the clock back, re rewind the clock back to kind of 2008, a lot of rounds that were raised kind of in that period had ratchets, right? Had really heavy anti dilution clauses. And the reality was, is if you wanted to go public at a significant down round, the cost to the company in terms of incremental dilution was so high 
that actually was in the best interest of these companies not to go public because they would be diluting themselves right to the ground with a down round. The reality of the moment we live in today is a lot of these ZERP rounds, they didn't have ratchets. It was the opposite. They were very light on terms and they were very light on structures. So you don't have this dynamic of super heavy ratchets, anti-dilution clauses that structurally make it really difficult to go public at a down round. It's it's just really more about like, how do you manage promises you made to employees, right? You hired people two years ago, you said you're going to be worth X and all of a sudden you're worth Y. Like, do you lose the, do you lose the trust? Um, I think it's more of those types of issues versus real structural ones. And sorry, Ed, I'll let, I'll let you. Yeah, no, I, 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 this is great. I, I'll just say that this also makes you realize who your board is as well, right? Because I think, look, the majority of companies that go, do go public this year will be down rounds from the prior rounds, especially if they raised during the ZERP era. It just is a reality, right? I think the question to your point, Harry, is at what price are you willing to go below? Is it 50%? Is it 30%? Is it whatever? I think part of the answer too is um, there are some benefits and there's some negative issues with going public, right? Benefits could be you now have a public currency in which you can hire some amazing talent as a public company now because there aren't many people that want to work at a late stage company right now unless they know what the price is, right? So it's hard to know what my restricted stock's really worth unless it's public. Two is, is now you have a public currency in which maybe you have three or four companies you want to buy. And once again, the buyer now um, and the buyer, you know, as a public company can go out and talk to a private company and say, Hey, look, I've got real stock that's really valued. And within six months, perhaps you can sell that thing. So those are positives, right? To really accumulate and accelerate that platform play. The negative would be you're going to have to accept for the most part that it's going to be tough to get an up round if you did raise during 2021. I mean, there's pretty much unlikely that the valuation you raised that in 2021, um, you know, you probably raised a really great multiple at that point in time. Given the fact that it takes six to nine months to really get in shape for an IPO, I don't think you're going to see much go out in 2024. I think the oh, earliest... I think people have been prepping for the last 18 months, Harry. Like the people are ready. So I'm just saying the ones that have thought about going public, like the rubrics of the world, you know, all the they're almost all IPO ready now. It's just a matter of do they want to file confidentially or not. So those are the ones that are kind of I'm, I'm talking about kind of the the next herd. And if you're on if you're on the Databricks board, would you say to go public? Um, no, from what I know, A, I'm not on the board, but two is I heard that their expense line is still, you know, relative to the growth is still kind of not, but if you're going to go public, I think you've got to be cash flow break even. Um, I think you have to have, you know, 30% plus growth, which is probably what high growth is right now. Um, and you know, you've got to be moving towards a rule of 40 or 50, in, in my opinion, with slanted more towards growth than you are, you know, cash flow break even, right? So I think those are the things that you're going to need. But you know, as I said, Jamie could probably comment better than, than me on that. Yeah, I'll go back to, um, I love listening to podcasts, especially podcasts with some of the greats, right, that have been in the industry for a while. And there's a recent podcast that Bill Gurley was on. And they had a little bit of this discussion, which was, hey, well, the trouble with the public markets is there's lots of scrutiny. And like, everyone's kind of going to pick through your financials with a fine tuned comb. And like, maybe we don't want that. Right. And, and I think what he basically said was like, grow up, you know, like, what, do you not want that scrutiny? Do you, do you want to be a child? Right. And I think the, the metaphor he raised or that he brought up was imagine a college athlete, a college athlete says, you know what? I don't think I really want to go to the pros. People are going to really just look at my statistics and going to critique me a lot. And I'm going to be on national television. I think I'm just going to, I just want to stick to college. Uh, and he, he kind of like drew this parallel between this fear of like the scrutiny and and kind of like the microscope, like that's actually a good thing, right? Like that will force companies to get fit. That will force companies to talk about their path to profitability. It will force companies to think about why are we an enduring business over the next 10 years? And while it may seem scary, it's actually like a good forcing function on let's get fit. Like let's let's build the muscle that will help us sustain and endure for the next, call it, you know, 10 plus years. There's a generation of new firms, though, which I, I heard Brad uh, discuss on a, a different podcast, actually, and he mentioned this. So I'm copying his words, not being yeah. rude. Uh, uh, he said, you know, there's a generation of firms that have been created, which basically extend that private window. Um, and if you apply that scenario, they're the Twinkie bars. They're the snooze on your alarm clock that you don't go to the gym. They're the ones that are letting you stay in that, you know, less mm -hmm. tier, stopping mm -hmm. you from going pro. And so... I guess my question is like, is this not a world that we've created? And I mean this respectfully, is that not part of Altimeter's business? 
Well, look, I mean, I think in general, if you look at the venture capital market, like it's ex- it's expanded massively over the last 10 years. And I, I saw some tweet from Gokul the other day who, who brought up like Bessemer's memo on mind body. And it was, it was kind of crazy to go back and look, right? This was 2010 and they were doing a deal at 10 million of ARR at 42 pre. And you're thinking that wasn't that long ago, <laughs> right? Like 10 million of ARR at 42 pre, like it wasn't, you know, 14, you know, 13, 14 years ago, like the reality is the venture markets have expanded so dramatically. Again, another Doug Leone quote, right? You know, he called venture, it's moved from a high margin cottage industry, right? To a low margin mainstream industry. And there are lots of implications of that. Um, I think one implication is you have these really big funds, right? Who their mandate is to put money into private companies, right? When you have big pools of capital, a very big supply, right? Chasing, I'd say the scarce resource, right? Which is the high quality founders and and high quality businesses. It can create this dynamic of keeping companies private for longer, right? You had companies like Twilio and Mongo and Shopify, right? Like the list goes on of like, really not that old companies that went public at a billion, $2 billion, right? Valuations, right? And they saw their company's value appreciate significantly in the public markets, right? And the challenge of staying public for longer is companies generally follow this growth curve, right? Of growth mode to maturity mode. And the challenge is if you if you wait too long and you go public, once you're in kind of like degrowth mode, the story and the multiple that you will get will be drastically different. And if you're not profitable and your growth is really starting to slow, there's just not going to be much appetite in the public markets. And you just have to be willing to accept like a two times, three times revenue multiple, right? And that's a very different outcome than going public earlier in that journey. And so I'd encourage lots of companies just to think more critically about like, should we go public sooner? Just let's accept that down round, right? In the same way layoffs were this taboo thing from 2022, no one wanted to do them. And then everyone started doing them and they were okay. I think kind of down rounds or down round IPOs will be the same thing. There'll be a taboo on them, but they'll be normal. F- final one before we do a quick fire, but I, I mentioned Jason Lamkin, but you know, talked to him a lot. He said the biggest worry that I have, you know, 15, 16, whatever years it is into SaaS investing is that the growth has slowed. Have we reached saturation point in software spend? No CFOs have like AI as a line item on their budgets. Yes, they will want it, but it's, it's not a line item have we reached saturation of software spend and does growth or the deceleration of company growth show that? Um, I would, I would answer it a couple of different ways. Um, I shouldn't be in the business if I didn't think of creative destruction and that the world gets reinvented every, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Right. So I fundamentally believe that with the new platform shift happening with kind of AI, and by the way, I'm not an AI investor and nor do I chase AI things. I just believe AI is just part of what we do every day. It's going to be infused in most software where it makes sense, where people will pay for it, where it's economically uh, important. But I do think we're going to enter a new cycle where things have been around 15 years and they're going to get reinvented. As an early stage investor, I need to believe that. And that's always going to be the case. Secondly, um, yeah, Jason's right on, and things have slowed down. They're not growing hundred percent year over year. Um, yeah, enterprises aren't spending willy nilly. In fact, enterprises bought, um, way ahead of the curve, uh, thinking they're continuing to grow up and to the right. And the other part would be probably 25% of all this revenue from all these tech companies was selling to other startups that shit vaporized, dude. So if you look at the growth from that, that automatically kind of dragged everything down. But I do think that the customers that are signing on board last year are buying at the right numbers. And, you know, from there, you know, this new cohort of customers, I think that retention is going to get back to a place where it's more like 110. So that could be 130, 140, but maybe healthy numbers like 110, 115. So we're going to work through it all, but I think that um, we're going to actually come back to the point where retention will get back up and, and we have to believe that people are going to create new things all the time, which I do. That's optimistic. I'm so glad to hear that, Ed. That makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> I got one for you too, Harry. I got I got a crazy one. Like the other thing is there's these new markets that you just don't even know what's going to happen, particularly like in cyber. Like even like protect AI in the AI security space. We funded that thing in early 2022 when the thesis was three years from now, maybe there'll be a seminal event in, in security and AI that's going to actually 
make people rush run for the hills. We didn't realize GPT would come around, you know, at the end of the year, and all of a sudden AI security now is a, a big deal. Um, but you know, the point is, is that there's always these new things that we never have thought of because we're not smart enough to think about it. It's the crazy founders that do. And I need to, you know, we all need to keep our eyes open for, for those types of things too. Yeah. Are we ready to do a quick fire chaps? Let's do it. Okay. So uh, let's go with Ed. What's the best investment advice you've received? This shit is really fucking hard and it takes a long time. So you got to be patient. And the things that always seem like they're the best ones in your portfolio may eventually be the worst and the vice versa. So you got to figure that out. You got to ride through the times. And, and I think when things are going really, really well, that's when you challenge the foundries even more. And when things are shitty, that's where you kind of pick them off of the ground and maybe kind of cheer them on a little bit. So I call that my three CHs, cheer, challenge, and chill. And you kind of do the opposite. Um, and, you know, sometimes the worst ones can come out and, and create some value for you. Jamin, what investment advice do you most often give? Hmm. I mean, I, I think they're very related. I think most of the investment advice that I might give was investment that advice was that was given to me. Uh, so in many ways, they're similar. Uh, but I would say, look, like you know, I can't remember who said this, um, but like, cool is the is the enemy of reality, right? There are a lot of products in venture or companies that seem cool, but like at the end of the day, you need some you need to solve a real tangible problem for someone. There's someone on the other end of the buying decision is putting in a purchase order who is making a case to their boss that this is the problem that I'm solving with this product. And here is exactly why I'm buying it. Right. And so you have a lot of cool products that sound good, but at the end of the day, it's the boring stuff um, that, that really actually moves the needle and, and builds the big businesses. Honestly, yeah, when I look at my portfolio, it's the boring stuff that provides the returns. <laughs> the sexy never never works. Uh, fucking consumer social. The problem is that uh, boring became sexy for a few years and, and that kind of yeah. destroyed the valuations for a while. Sure. Amazing yeah. how sexy <laughs> dev tools can be, isn't it? Like, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, now, Jamin, you're recused from this one uh, for compliant <laughs> reasons. Uh, Ed, you're not. You're not getting away with this. What's your buy and short for 2024 with the year ahead? I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm looking at Microsoft, uh, you know, even though that's still priced pretty high, I just think that because of their lead on everything AI, that they're taking market share on the cloud side. So I think that that's going to drive a lot of their business. And I'm hoping that by the back half of the year, you know, you start seeing some of the revenue numbers reflect in that, that we might long, uh, my short would probably be, I mean, just what everyone's looking at now is just Apple right now. I think, I think Apple. You know, you've got an iPhone growth issue uh, over there at Apple. But I, what, the one thing that gets me excited about Apple is the idea of uh, machine learning and AI on the edge device, whether it's in the laptops now uh, or even in the phones. As these models get smaller and get pushed out onto these devices, I think there's going to be some interesting stuff built uh, that has privacy, compliance built in, speed built into that. But I don't see where that results in revenue in, in, in this year from that perspective. I'm more excited than ever about Apple. I think their ability to run models locally on device gives them unparalleled access and advantage. It's all about access to that end consumer point. Yeah. I agree with you. It's five years out maybe. Yeah. But, I, but that, that shit's exciting. All the stuff on the edge. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Which under the radar company or company less discussed do you think will have a killer 2024? Hmm. Public, private, and all the above. You can give me anything, Jamin. Look, I, I think a broader theme that I truly believe in, right, is you don't have an AI strategy without a data strategy, right? And a lot of the, the AI value prop today really comes down to, do you have your data house in order? Um, and so I think we're going to see a lot of, well, maybe without shilling portfolio companies. <laughs> you you know, I should, think you see... should. You wouldn't be a VC if you don't yeah. shill. Go <laughs> shill, please. Sure. I think you're going to see a lot of like data businesses and data platforms like really take off as folks realize, hey, we have to get our data house in order before we can truly adopt a lot of this AI stuff. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so maybe in, in true VC fashion, right? Tabular is a business that is building a data lake house solution around Apache Iceberg, which uh, the founders built inside of Netflix um, that I think is super exciting, right? And in kind of this data lake house, right? You have Databricks, the behemoth, the big gorilla in the space. Um, I think that category is a really big and important one. And, and I think Tabular is going to play a, a pretty big role in, in the future of that. Ed? I'll just shill right at the bat. 
Okay, so he, <laughs> um, to to his point, I think that there's no AI in the enterprise without AI security, and I think that's a completely new category now. Um, but I do see a lot of pain, whether it be the idea of ML SecOps, which is kind of um, understanding kind of how data scientists uh, are building their models and kind of how secure the data is, how secure the models are, all the way to um, the idea of what we'll called ML bombs, uh, the bill of materials. What goes into, you know, because an S bomb would be software, but an ML bomb includes data and the model and the software. So I'll show Protect AI, which I really love the founder. It's his third company right now. He is uh, out there assigning some pretty interesting uh, enterprise customers. Uh, and he's got a really interesting product strategy and, and product to boot. So I'm just going to shill. And I think there's going to be a lot of other AI uh, security companies coming down the pike as well. And I think the big boys are going to start paying attention to, to that as the customers ask for it. What do LPs not know right now that they should know? Hmm. Sure. You know, I would say... Maybe a slight, I'll, I'll rephrase, I'll rephrase the question slightly. Like I would say, you know, LPs know a lot, right? But, but maybe what is a, a misconception? Think so? I think, you know, it, maybe, and, and there's obviously a spectrum. Um, I, I would say maybe what's like a misconception. I think you do have a lot of folks who view venture as something they can kind of like pick vintages to sit in and out of. Um, and I would say picking vintages from the LP side is, is really hard. Um, the, you know, the, in my opinion, right, like the right approach is pick a manager and, and pick managers and manager selection right now is more important than ever and invest across those kind of that small set of managers, like across vintages and, and kind of like, that's the better way to diversify versus let me try and pick a vintage, um, you know, and manage around that. I think that generally leads to kind of like missing some of the best vintages, right? Market timing is very hard in any asset class. Um, but yeah, that, so that's, that, that's what I would say. Sim? Me, I don't know. I mean, some LPs may, this is the time to put money to work. I mean, that, that, and so that could be counterintuitive. Maybe some LPs don't want the capital calls, but the firms that are making capital calls in 2024, putting dollars to work, I think this is going to be an amazing vintage uh, because people are uh, valuation adjusted. I think founders have the religion of the ones starting from now. And I think this is going to be a fucking incredible vintage five years from now. I got to leave some optimism here. You know, if yeah. you're, if you're investing at our stage, if I'm not optimistic, I might as well not be in the business, but that's kind of what I, what I look at now. Let's finish on a final one. You said about optimism. We don't like negativity. What are we most optimistic about looking forward to 2024? Jamming Maybe to, to tack on, right? I mean, I think a topic that we've been discussing today, like companies are being built the right way, right? And I think that is happening at an inflection point of a massive technology shift, right? I think when I think about like, where do I want to be investing? You know, I want to be investing in kind of a period that is right. Like the bottom half of the valuation reset with the first half of a technology shift, right? It's really hard to call like, are we at the bottom? Um, are we 20% off the bottom? Like that it's too hard to do. But I think the setup for this year for next year is that we're in the bottom half or maybe the bottom third of the valuation reset. And in the first third of a massive technology shift, that's going to create a ton of creative destruction. Uh, and so maybe just kind of to echo what Ed just said, I am incredibly optimistic about this period in time, the startups that will be created, the opportunities to create value and, and kind of like the opportunity for this kind of vintage this year, next year, right, to, to be a special one. Ed? Call me stupid crazy, but I am bullish on Israeli founders building new startups. Um, you know, we have over a dozen Israeli founding teams right now, and two of my fastest growing companies in Fund Five, Vintage uh, 2021, which had you know funded at inception to now, from zero to about two million of ARR, were both Israeli infrastructure companies. And mind you, one of the teams that two of the founders called into reserve duty as they're in a in a very special unit. Um, and despite all that, they still grew faster than any other portfolio company. The resiliency is off the fucking charts. And um, I think that as people back away from Israel because they're fearful of kind of what's happening there, I'm still seeing amazing teams there. And I think there are going to be great opportunities to keep putting dollars to work uh, in security and infrastructure deals in Israel. 
guys i uh i saw the tweets when i was in the gym you know doing a pump because i've got to get you know up to shape with ed and i'm so glad that uh, we did this thank you so much for doing this on a weekend you've been fantastic and and jamming you know you haven't seen my negativity before so uh ed's used to this <laughs> shit by now <laughs> I'm, I'm used to harry's negative i like seeing the negativity harry because that's good it's good no this is fun thanks for uh, yeah. putting it together <laughs>